in the chat box and, uh, and we'll go from there. Andrea is going to kick it off and she's going to talk about sort of the larger uh, view and talk about the habitat features at the forest. And Ethan's then going to discuss the forest management that's taking place on that site to uh, enhance the health of the forest and the property for wildlife. So at this point, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Andrea and let her talk about it. Awesome. All right. Thank you. Let me just get the camera here. Um, okay, great. We're going to talk about the Andrews Community Forest in Richmond, which before we had started, we were joking about how many community forest talks we've done. We knew we were going to mess up. So just saying that the Andrews Community Forest out in Richmond, um, and I'm going to kind of give an overview of how the forest uh, fits into a larger landscape of, of conserved and forested properties and then kind of zoom in on some of the habitat features um, and uh, unique features that you'll find on the forest and then I'll pass it on to, to Ethan. So, let's see. So if any of you have seen a presentation by me before, you know that I usually like to start out by kind of taking this really wide lens view help us get a little perspective on how we fit into the bigger picture. And um, so here in Vermont, you know, we're part of the largest, most intact, temperate, broadleaf deciduous forest in the world, um, which is just a really long way of saying we're part of a globally significant forest. Um, it stretches from New York all the way to Nova Scotia, up um, to the Gaspésie Bay, and uh, down to southern Vermont, the north, northern Massachusetts. Um, and this whole region is called the Northern Appalachian uh, Acadian Ecoregion. And so this large forest supports about 470 vertebrate species and more than 2,700 plant species. And some of these species are just local endemics and they're rare and you're not going to find them anywhere else in the world. Um, and the mo mosaic of the forest and the well <laughs> in this area, in this region, creates a network for the animals to freely roam across this wide <laughs> And we're talking about big mammals here. We're talking about Canada lynx, black bear, moose, big things that need a lot of space to move around. Um, and so within this large forest, conservation groups have identified nine critical linkage areas, which are basically geographically defined places that if they were no longer forested and no longer connected, it would really impact and severely limit the ability of wildlife to move back and forth across the region. Um, and the functionality of these forests would be severely diminished. So these linkage areas are highlighted here on the map and you can see where the, the arrows and, and how the movement is kind of predicted through that, through those areas. So here's a different view of those linkages, another map, um, and you can, it really highlights uh, that six of these linkage areas, six of the nine, are in Vermont. Um, just kind of highlighting how important where we are is. Uh, we know that these linkage areas are extremely critical to wildlife. Um, not only do individual animals need to be able to move back and forth to get food, find mates, um, meet their other life needs, um, but they also need this connectivity between their core habitat areas um, and other areas which to allow the, the animals to migrate um, as their habitat changes in response to climate change. And over time, these linkages will help maintain genetic diversity within the wildlife populations. And um, this is also true for plant species. We talk about it in forests and tree species moving a lot, but it's on a much longer, uh, slower time scale. So if we zoom into Vermont, uh, the large forest blocks here are covered in, in colored in brown, and there's a star uh, where the Andrews Community Forest is. Um, you can see that the linkage areas in the state uh, don't, don't just highlight uh, movements from north to south, but they also highlight the movements from east to west too. And so if we take a look again at that larger map, it's really easy to see that within this larger globally important forest, Vermont is really important for the crossroads and how we manage and conserve our forests here in the state will have a, a larger impact on the, the wildlife in the forests um, in that larger region. Uh, so this is a graphic from the Nature Conservancy um, that predicts how wildlife will be migrating and moving into the future as our climate changes. Um, you can see that Vermont and upstate New York is predicted to be a key pathway around the Great Lakes and into Canada. Um, you can see kind of the, the different colors or different types of animals um, in, in <coughs> as they get to Vermont, but um, that's mostly because of the, the weather, which, you know, may be changing as we move forward. <laughs> 
all of this is just to say that, you know, as we face climate change, um, we know that connectivity is considered to be one of the most important strategies for allowing forests and wildlife to adapt um, to a new climate. Species need to be able to move, adapt, and change, and protecting these pathways is going to be increasingly important in the future. And I think as, as a society, as a conservation group here, um, we do a really great job of conserving special places and protecting specific areas but we also need to focus on how these conserved areas are connected to each other and how important those linkages are. And uh, the management of these areas will uh, excuse me, facilitate uh, the continued connectivity in the area. So this is, this is a kind of a busy map, but the Andrews Community Forest is highlighted in that green outline kind of in the middle of the screen. And what this map shows is connected forest blocks and um, interior forest blocks that we've identified uh, on, in, on the state level. And it's just to show that the, the, the community forest here in Richmond um, is right in the middle of a really important interior forest block um, that extends into the Mount Mansfield and Camel, Camel's Hump ranges. And as you move west towards uh, Burlington, towards the, the lake, you can see that those large forest blocks really diminish quickly. So the Andrews Community Forest is really kind of on the edge of these um, more fragmented forests. And here's just another kind of scientific way of looking at uh, habitat blocks and where the forest is. The deeper the color uh, on the screen is kind of the larger the area of that habitat block. You can see that the Andrews Forest is um, one of the bigger one of the bigger blocks in the region and it's still directly connected um, to the Winooski River and to these larger connected or larger uh, blocks um, that move up and down the Green Mountains. And so this is important when we start looking at the pattern of forests and how wildlife is present in these forest patches. Um, so if you have a kind of a generic forest in Vermont or in New England, um, you can see here in an undeveloped large continuous forest, you have all of these species. And as you start breaking that forest down into into smaller sizes, you're going to start losing different species. Um, some of these wide-ranging species aren't going to be present anymore until you get down to a, a you know, less than a 20-acre block and you have those wildlife species that we have come to know as more suburban, urban wildlife. So raccoons, skunks, squirrels that you see around. Um, and so this just kind of goes to show the importance, if we take a look at this map again, of, of this large habitat block that uh, the Andrews Community Forest is part of. And, the different type of wildlife that it can support because of its size. So let's just kind of switch gears a little bit and kind of take a, a closer look at the, the forests on a habitat level and what you're going to find. Um, some unique features here on this map that Ethan made um, highlights deer wintering areas, bear mass stands, vernal pools, we've got open areas, um, edges, which are, are important wildlife features that we don't talk about too often. Uh, riparian areas, and then a variety of natural communities, which Ethan will go into in a little bit. So the first, first unique habitat feature I want to talk about is deer wintering areas. Uh, we're close to the northern limit of white-tailed deer, so basically their strategy to survive our cold winters is to go into energy conservation mode. They kind of enter a semi-hibernating state um, where they basically conserve their energy, they hunker down, they don't move around a lot. Um, and they restrict kind of their daily movements to only those that are absolutely necessary. And they, they basically seek shelter in, in softwood forests um, that have continuous cover. It blocks the snow, blocks the wind, makes it easy for them to move around a little bit, uh, a little bit easier in the snow. And so here on, the, on that map with the, the forest highlighted again, in that kind of beige color, those are, that's our, our known uh, wintering areas. And you can see it's connected uh, throughout the town um, into other parcels, but as those parcels get smaller and smaller, we can probably assume that the functionality of those wintering areas become less and less as um, these areas are either developed or broken down into different housing units, uh, driveways, people with, you know, with pets and, and animals in the area really reduce the functionality of those wintering areas. Um, so in the Andrews Community Forest, we have these kind of dark hemlocky forest that this is kind of a typical deer wintering area, but there's also south-facing slopes which also get a lot of sun exposure in the winter and, and um, 
kind of help alleviate some of those that cold uh, Vermont winters that we here <laughs> deal with. So we also have what we call bear mass stands on the forest. And these are areas that are known to be historically used by bears uh, to be eating different types of nuts uh, year after year. It's um, a learned behavior. Um, mother bears pass it on down to their cubs to, to go to areas. And we know that these are historically used because we can see items like um, these bear nests that are, that picture in the middle is basically the bear nest where a bear is crawled up into, into the canopy, has been eating the beech nuts, and, and as they do that, they bring the branches to them and um, they basically leave it and creates kind of a nest. Um, we also can identify uh, bear claw marks on the trunk of beech trees to help identify these mass stands, which is the picture on the left there. If you look at it, you can see uh, patterns of bear claws moving up and down the tree. Um, and so, these stands are often um, either in beach stands, oak stands, but um, really any kind, of, any kind of tree that has a mast, which is either a, a nut or a fruit um, that provides food for wildlife, is called a mast species. And so even outside of these mapped mast stands in the forest, we have a variety of species that provide food for different, different wildlife species, not just bears. Um, and some of these species are uh, hawthorns, black cherry, uh, there's a ton of hawthorn beam on certain parts of the forest. Um, and then other things like uh, high bush mountain cranberry, raspberry, um, sumac, all of these, all of these species uh, produce food for wildlife and are extremely important during all different times of the year. Um, so the vernal pools that are mapped uh, on the forest are really exciting and unique features. They're probably one of the coolest places to be in the woods in uh, March and April because they're so um, And so if you're not familiar with what a vernal pool is, it's, it's a small ephemeral pool in, in upland forests and it's not connected to any other waterway or stream. Um, basically they're depressions in kind of the forest floor where snow and snowmelt collects. Um, and it's a critical amphibian breeding, breeding area. Uh, is the base kind of of the food web for the forest where uh, a ton of invertebrates will be breeding and then uh, salamanders and frogs will come and breed and feed on those invertebrates. Um, what's really important is, is knowing where these um, pools are because even well, to know where they are, they're very obvious to find uh, in the spring. But as the summer moves along and, and things dry out, it's important to be able to identify these depressions because as you're doing forest management in an area, you want to make sure that um, you maintain all of the depressions and kind of stay away from um, creating ruts in these areas because it, it can change the hydrology and kind of impact um, the ability of, of different species to breed in, in these areas. So the Andrews Community Forest also has a large um, open area and a large uh, swath of the Belco power line. Um, or the, at least the telephone line. Um, and these are actually really important wildlife features in a forest setting. It creates a lot of diversity um, on the landscape and, and a variety of, of structures. And actually um, 29 species of greatest conservation need in the state uh, rely on these open kind of young forest, old field kind of shrubby areas, um, in addition to many of our, our common species. Um, and there's several different management options, with, which I think Ethan will talk about a little bit about how um, we can either move some of these forests, these, these areas into different successional stages or maintain them the way they are. And these are just kind of the areas that you're going to see a lot of songbird ab activity, um, pollinator activity, um, bats, small mammals, bears are going to be using these a lot as well. And so that brings us into looking at, at the edge, which is really a transition zone between the, the deep dark forests and these open areas. And they're, they're used by a variety of wildlife. Um, they're often used for traveling and for safety and, and also for feeding because this is where a lot of pro productive uh, fruit producing shrubs are gonna be found. And so when we're looking at a forest, we wanna try to maintain what we call a soft edge, which is kind of a, a gradual um, transition between these two ecotones versus a hard edge, which is a really sharp, um, obvious, obvious switch. And so um, when we look at forest management and we look at um, these different habitat types, we kind of recommend a soft edge about 20 to 30 feet wide. And that's maintained 
through through mowing every couple of years and cutting back the trees just to maintain that um, gradual transition um, from one spot to another. And so here's, here's a picture of a telephone line. It's actually in Williston, but it just really highlights how productive these areas can actually be for wildlife throughout the year. It provides areas for turkey poults to be uh, bugging, uh, looking for insects and hiding in the cover, provides sumac for birds to be eating all winter, and then of course uh, blossoms and um, structures for animals to be feeding and hiding on, hiding in during the rest of the year. So the, the Andrews Community Forest has a couple really nice riparian areas that move through the forest. Um, and these areas are sometimes overlooked as important wildlife zones, but they're really uh, key transitional zones where, where animals are going to be moving up and down to one spot in the forest and the other. Uh, the picture on the left is in one of the riparian areas. Uh, I took that picture in, I want to say April this year. And so not too many things have started popping out, but you can see that this is where kind of the heavier vegetation is following along the river. And the picture on the right on the screen is uh, a bobcat study that our department did. And it has, we have a GPS collared bobcat moving through, I think this is in Addison County, just showing uh, its movements throughout a day, and it really highlights how close it sticks to these riparian areas. And I need to make sure that I explain what riparian area is, because that's one of the terms that I think we use quite often and, and kind of uh, forget to explain ourselves. But it's, it's really just the, the, the zone between the water and the, the land. So it's this aquatic terrestrial zone we call the riparian area. And they're extremely important for wildlife. So let's just take a, a quicker look at some of these habitat features um, in more of a general sense of what they can produce for wildlife. Uh, the first would be a diversity of species um, on, in the forest, not just in these key, key areas that we've talked about, but throughout the, the whole forest and the different communities. Um, and we want to make sure there's a diversity of species for, for wildlife because it provides different food sources throughout the year. Um, and some years, uh, some food sources will be plentiful and some won't. And as long as we have a diversity of those, those food producers, um, most of the wildlife will be happy throughout you know, each season and each year. And we also wanna take a look at the structural diversity of a forest. And um, you know, we, we say quite often, if you go on a walk with either Ethan or I, that uh, wildlife likes it messy. And what that means is we like forests that you can't see through. Um, Forests that have a, a variety of structure and um, different layers in their, in their structure uh, provide a habitat for a variety of different animals from the scarlet tanager that you're gonna find in the very top canopy singing in the, in the middle of the forest down to the forest floor where you're gonna have oven birds nesting and, and uh, hiding in the structure there. So here's just another illustration of how different species are gonna be using different uh, layers in the vertical canopy differently. Uh, we have the golden wing warbler, um, who's going to be using kind of all of that area that, or excuse me, that's not a golden wing warbler. Uh, it's a black-throated green warbler. Um, and that's going to be in the forest using kind of a mid-story uh, canopy layer. Whereas opposed to the black-throated blue warbler, you're going to find down at the bottom uh, hanging out in the hollow bush and, and the other shrubs. And uh, Ethan will talk about kind of the different management techniques that we're going to be using on the, the community forest here to enhance some of those areas. But um, I just wanted to throw the slide in to kind of reiterate the point that integrating timber management, forest management, and producing songbird habitat are not mutually exclusive. They're actually quite compatible and uh, kind of reliant on each other and sometimes. So if we take another look at diversity of habitat features um, in providing structure, one of the biggest things for wildlife um, are providing snags and dead trees, den trees. And these are, snags are basically standing dead trees that, um, you know, have ended the, their, the living part of their life cycle and, and haven't fallen over yet, but they provide extremely important habitat for a variety of, of invertebrates, um, birds, amphibians, mammals, uh, you name it. Uh, something is probably using that snag. And then, of course, when the snag no longer uh, is standing, it becomes what we call coarse woody material. And this provides uh, a variety of habitat for different species, um, even when they fall down. 
So we have a, a root, a tip up or a, a root wad uh, on the right hand side of the screen and that is extremely important habitat for winter wrens. They make their nests in uh, those root wads um, throughout the, the forest or um, they just become, if the root doesn't come over with the snag as it falls down, it just becomes a, a log and, and that um, becomes an important habitat feature for decades after, after it falls down. So this is just another slide to kind of emphasize the importance of coarse woody material that we're gonna leave in the forest um, as the forest management happens. And just to highlight that um, the, the right hand side of the screen, um, that coarse log that has fallen over has now become a nursery tree providing uh, habitat for the next generation of trees to, to be growing out of it. And you know, it, it will continue to improve the soil health and habitat for, for uh, all of the species around there. So another habitat feature that is present on the community forest is um, old rock walls, which is actually a really um, neat habitat feature that we have in Vermont that we don't quite think of as always producing, producing habitat. But a lot of our native pollinators and a lot of our, our, our native bees um, will live in these rock walls. They're, they're, they're kind of a rock pile dwelling species. Um, so it also provides habitat for small mammals and uh, amphibians as well. Um, there's a couple of cars out on the Andrew Community Forest and you know I, I think they do also provide the same sort of habitat whether <laughs> we want to admit that or not. But um, creating, creating rock piles and, and maintaining these stone walls and um, brush piles creates another micro uh, habitat that, that we'll be doing in the forest management. And then uh, Going back to the connectivity, one thing that we want to maintain um, in general as we do forest management on the forest is maintain the connectivity. Um, as we explained earlier, how important that is for wildlife. Um, maintaining these riparian corridors and making sure that they have wide buffers um, for animals to be moving back and forth. And basically, the way that you manage for this is just allowing the dead, dead material and, and trees to to accumulate along that corridor. It's kind of a hands-off, easy approach to uh, maintaining those connections. And, you know, I've, I talked a lot about large uh, connectivity, um, looking at moose and black bears, but we also want to consider small-scale con connectivity um, for uh, all of our pollinator species and, and small things that are, are, you know, have a, have a worldview that's a much smaller than, <laughs> than a moose. And so in these open areas, as we figure out how we're going to be managing them, um, maintaining um, hedgerows and no cut strips is extremely important and will help um, just kind of enhance uh, the pollinator value of, of the forest here. So I guess with that, um, I'm going to transfer over to Ethan and then we will take questions at the end. So let's see. If he's there. He'll join in a second. I think he's going to just boot up and turn on his camera and switch over. So um, okay. while we're looking at that, uh, Andrea, just one quick question. You had mentioned the Chittenden Uplands and Jeff wanted to know how does this relate to the Chittenden County Uplands? Um, are you going to talk about that, Ethan? Yeah, I'll speak to that. Okay. Perfect. Um, I'll, I'll show you in just one second, Jeff. I'm, I'm going to uh, refer to it right in the beginning of the slideshow here. All right, so my name is Ethan Tapper. I'm the Chittenden County Forester. And um, we're here for a couple of reasons. We're here to, to learn about wildlife, uh, wildlife habitat, forest management, and also how this, how this applies specifically to an upcoming, very soon upcoming forest management project at the Andrews Community Forest. And so a big goal of this project is demonstration and outreach and expressing the different ways that uh, forest management can be beneficial and can be really well done with respect to all sorts of different um, things that we care about. And so uh, with that in mind, I'm gonna uh, dig into some of the, the, the forest management specifics that we're gonna do, some specifics about Andrews um, and about spe specifically how we're gonna be managing for wildlife in addition to the, all the other sort of holistic forest management work that we're gonna be doing. All right. Cool. So wildlife and forest management at the Andrews Community Forest. Um, 
That's a picture of a black bear that was actually taken by some field naturalists who were doing a program at Andrews. Andrews is, among many other things, really, really great black bear and white-tailed deer habitat. So there, this is, you know, similar to the picture that, that Andrea um, had put up. Uh, it's really an interesting thing to look at how the Andrews Community Forest sort of fits into this larger landscape. And this goes to the, the comment or the question from Jeff about the Chinning County Uplands project. So here we are, uh, here's Andrews perched on the edge of the, the fragmented Champlain Valley. You know, here we have the airport, South Burlington, Williston, all these other areas that have less large uh, intact blocks of forested habitat. And right at the edge here, we have Andrews. And they're not on this map, but Andrews is actually contiguous to a number of different other uh, conserved and otherwise protected parcels. In the early 1990s, uh, a bunch of folks got together, including uh, Sue Morris of Keeping Track and Mike Snyder, who was then the Chittenden County Forester and folks from the Vermont Land Trust and um, the Forest Legacy Program of the US Forest Service. And they started this project called the Chittenden County Uplands Project, which eventually conserved about 8,000 acres of land in Chittenden County, uh, mostly, if not all, in Richmond, Jericho, uh, and Bolton. Maybe a little bit in Huntington. I think Richmond, Jericho, and Bolton. Um, so right here, for instance, is the, the largest privately owned parcel in Chittenden County, which is about 1,700 acres. To the east of the Andrews Community Forest is a, a property owned by the Vermont Youth Conservation Corps that's conserved by the Richmond Land Trust. And there's a bunch of other parcels that are all sprinkled around here. Um, and if you cross a couple of roads, you get over to the Mount Mansfield State Forest into a 70,000 acre habitat block. So Andrews is, is sort of right on that edge, which actually provides it with some, some benefits of that core forest habitat and some benefits of that uh, smaller chunks of habitat as well, um, which actually, you know, we don't want it everywhere, but it does have some habitat benefits. So this is that, the, the forest, what's called a forest stand map that I created for Andrews um, with the forest management plan that I wrote and that was adopted last year by the town of Richmond. <clears throat> the, the Andrews Community Forest has a number of um, different things that we, that we put into place basically to, to protect the sensitive features and to, uh, that are on the property and to manage it really well. And so uh, this is a, you know, a whole lot of blobs of different colors, but, but to, what we can point out is that um, it's been divided into a number of different forest stands. So these numbers here are uh, delineating sort of different areas of the forest that we call a stand, which just means that they're similar enough um, to be managed as a group. So as a forester, you go out to different areas and based on the species that are there, um, the different ages of trees, the different management history, you, you group them up into these different areas that we call stands. So that's what those numbers are. Um, these uh, colored blocks are different areas. These areas in green are part of our reserve forest zone, which I'll talk about just in a second. Um, these other colored polygons are areas that were delineated either in the conservation easement as special natural communities, including red pine forest, dry oak forest, and others, and also by a subsequent uh, evaluation that a group of field naturalists from, from UVM, from the Field Naturalist Graduate Program did. They just delineate, these are some areas of forest that are really, really special and worth protecting. Um, and so we afforded them some special protections. So the different sort of levels of, um, of protection and uh, different rules that we have for Andrews are listed here. So the first is the conservation easement. The property is formally conserved with a conservation easement that's held by the Vermont Land Trust and the Vermont Housing and Conservation Board. And, and all that means is um, it can never be developed, it can never be subdivided, and there are specific uh, protections given to stuff like these vernal pools that Andrea mentioned, these riparian areas, just the area around these rivers that will be managed in a specific way to protect water quality and aquatic habitat. Um, a couple other areas, the, those natural communities that I mentioned. In addition to that, in 2018, uh, we went through this big comprehensive management planning process, which many of you in Richmond will remember. That was done, uh, facilitated by SE Group. Um, and we also got funding from a, a recreation uh, what was it called? The Recreation Planning Grant from Vermont's Urban and Community Forestry Program, which funded for funded part of that. And in the management plan, which is sort of this broad governance document, we put um, some specific goals, objectives for the forest protections that are in place, which guide the management of the forest. 
Then last year, I wrote a forest management plan, which uh, was adopted as an addendum to the management plan, um, which just basically provided more specifics about how we're gonna manage the forest um, and what exactly we're gonna do. Uh, uh, in addition to the, the protections in the conservation easement and in the management plan, in the forest management plan, we also divided up the forest into three uh, management intensity zones. So I stole this idea from uh, out west, where, where folks often will use this, what's called a triad model, and also from the Heinsberg Town Forest, which adopted a model like this um, in their 2012 forest management plan. And basically the idea is that um, different users, different people want different things from the forest, including some people who just want the forest to just exist and get to do its own thing and, and be sort of self-willed. Um, and also that we want different types of habitat that uh, are created by different types of management and different intensities of management across the landscape. So by providing different levels of management, including no management, we can provide a lot more than if we're just sort of managing the parcel all in the same way. So it, in the, with that in mind, this area that's sort of in this orange color uh, is I think that's that's zone one, which is basically a, an, a zone in which more intensive management is allowed. That's the area that was harvested very aggressively at Andrews in 2013 through or 2011 through 2013. So it's sort of already been managed aggressively. And some areas here in the south um, where the forests are just very young, they were fields in the 60s. Um, zone two is the area that we're gonna be doing work in this fall and winter and, and maybe next fall. This is the area sort of in maroon. In this area, sort of a, a forest management is allowed, but sort of light touch management. Um, we're using smaller equipment. We're not doing what's called whole tree harvesting. Um, and we're doing sort of this ecological forestry, which I'll describe in a second. In this green zone, uh, we're doing no management. So recognizing that also forests that are unmanaged are providing a lot of really important stuff. And we want to account for that. These green zones are features that are protected in the conservation easement features that were subsequently delineated by the, that field naturalist who delineated some additional interesting natural communities. Um, there's a couple areas in here that were just not harvested in that really aggressive 2011 through 2013 harvest. So I just kept it as sort of a, it'll be like an old growth inclusion in that relatively young forest um, and some areas of steep ground that I delineated. Each of these zones is about a third of the total area of the forest. Okay, so what we're going to do this year, and this will probably be starting as soon as it was supposed to start this week, but will probably actually start next week, is in this area that's sort of shaded in this periwinkle or purple color, um, we're going to be doing forest management. The area is about 100 acres. It's in stands three, four, and six uh, in Andrews Community Forest Forest Management Plan. Um, the total area is 100 acres, but we also have a provision that's in the forest management plan where Anywhere where we do management, we're going to set aside 20 acres um, that will be an unmanaged control. So that will be basically an educational tool to and, and a diversity feature um, across on the landscape because it's going to be managed all around it. Um, that will be and you know allow people to go and see what uh, this these same areas would look like if they hadn't been managed. Um, we th we think that this is going to last this fall. Um, this winter and, and maybe next fall, there is a provision in, in the management plan for Andrews that no forest management is allowed between April 1st and August 1st to account for bird breeding season. So if we don't finish it up this winter, it will then be completed next year, um, starting after August 1st. Uh, this, these areas, they've been forest for a long time. Um, they were pastured certainly in the 1800s and they were harvested most recently in the 1990s and again in the, in the early 2000s. All right, I'm gonna take a drink of water here. So as we define the context in which we're working, it's really, really important to understand where we're coming from. And so uh, we live in this highly, you know, what may seem in Vermont now that we're, you know, 75% forested, there's forests everywhere. Um, and, you know, lots of beautiful natural stuff to look at. Uh, it may not be clear that we live in this incredibly highly human altered landscape. So 
Uh, prior to European settlement, we think Vermont was great, more than 95% forested. Um, and as a result of um, European settlement and sheep pasturing and a bunch of other weird economic stuff, um, Vermont by the, by the mid 1800s was only 20 to 40% forested. So what that means is that basically everywhere uh, that except places that were really remote and really inaccessible was cleared or at, at the very least harvested at a very quick rotation. So some of these areas also were harvested for charcoal on a 30 year rotation, um, but mostly they were pasture. And so what that means is that basically everywhere you've ever been in Vermont, if you weren't somewhere really, really remote or on the top of a mountain was probably pasture at that time. Um, we think that 55 to 60% of New England's landscape was what we call old growth forest now, forests older than 150 years prior to European settlement. And, uh, and now it's about 0.4% across New England. So that's a massive shift in the type of forest that we had just a few hundred years ago to the forest we have now. Uh, and there are really enduring impacts on, on both forests, the function of forests, forest structure, um, and on wildlife. So, you know, in addition to all this stuff happening with forests, we uh, extirpated or drove to extinction many native species, including beaver and otter and marten and bear and deer and um, turkey and passenger pigeons, uh, our native ungulates, the eastern elk uh, and caribou. Many of these species were, uh, and our native predators, the, the eastern catamount um, and timber wolves, uh, many of these species were driven out of Vermont during this time as a combination of overexploitation, hunting and trapping, and then also habitat loss. So as a result, um, most of our forests in Vermont are less than 100 years old. So forests are these incredibly complex systems that develop over time, multiple generations of forests, or multiple generations of trees yielding you know, this really complex system. And our forests just really haven't had a chance to do that because most of them were a field less than 100 years ago. Many of them, you know, have been repeatedly managed as a pasture, you know, exploited for timber in a way that wasn't sustainable. Um, they're younger, they're less diverse. They then, uh, prior to pre-European settlement forests were likely to have been, they lack big trees, they lack uh, dead wood on the forest floor, which is really important as soil carbon. Um, and then across the landscapes, our landscapes also haven't had a chance to really diversify into this mix of forests of different sizes and shapes and ages and types. Um, so we also lack that diversity across the landscape. The species of trees that we have are different. Um, and in general, it can be said that we have overall less healthy, resilient and productive forests than, than we did um, prior to European settlement. So, if you, hear, you ever hear me talking, Andrea alluded to this as well, um, I will try and dispel a couple of myths that you have. And this is really important also as you judge active forest management, because uh, a lot of us judge logging forest management based on um, the incorrect assumption that forests are supposed to look really neat and tidy. And that really couldn't be any further from the truth. Um, healthy forests do not look neat to us they look messy and complex. They have many different sizes and ages of trees. There's dead wood on the forest floor. There's trees, uh, old, big old trees and trees with holes in them, all this stuff. Those are actually really important ecological features that challenge our sort of intuitive aesthetic sense. But the fact that it doesn't look neat to us doesn't mean that those forests aren't well managed or that they aren't healthy. And this second myth that's really important for people to understand as, as you think about forest management in general is that this idea that healthy forests are in some way static or unchanging. So uh, to the contrary, forests are dynamic. Uh, healthy forests are changing all the time. And a lot of foresters, when we see something like this, a tip up, you know, a tree that's fallen over and created a gap in the canopy of the forest, we don't think of this as, as sad or bad. We think of this as really exciting because what that's allowing to happen is change and through change comes more diversity, more complexity, more opportunities for different types of wildlife, more opportunities for different types of forest processes, all of which are, are really, really important. So um, when we think about sort of uh, how forests work in general and then how we apply that understanding to uh, forest management, think about these two things. The, the idea that forests should be, should look messy, that doesn't mean that 
every messy forest is necessarily healthy, but um, healthy forests often look very messy and that forests are dynamic and changing and that death and, and disturbance and change in the forest can actually be really profound and compelling and exciting and yield really, really important great stuff for the forest ecosystem. Now, in sort of thinking about, you know, what template do we have to manage our forests after? Um, we don't have that many old growth forests left in the Eastern United States, um, but we do have some, and we have a, a growing body of research about what old growth forests look like. And so for me, as I'm thinking about how do I want to manage forests, I want to manage forests like they manage themselves. I want to manage forests that have a range of natural processes that are uh, in line with how they would be historically and that um, ultimately is sort of taking cues from you know these systems that have evolved over thousands of years you know rather than something that we think is is better than that um, so East, eastern old growth forests we have yes there are some big old trees i think a lot of people probably think that old growth forests are nothing but big old trees um, but but there are some, but there are also many sizes and ages of trees. So this diversity of different ages is really, really important. And, and that's just a result of the fact that these forests are constantly undergoing these small scale disturbances. So old growth forests, a forest that's, you know, we say the forest is 150 plus years old. That doesn't mean that every tree is 150 plus years old, although some will be. It means that uh, this forest has uh, undergone only small scale disturbances in the last 150 years. And with every one of those little disturbance, that disturbances, you know, a tree falls over, several trees fall over, that's an opportunity for new growth and new regeneration and the establishment of different sizes and ages of trees. So over taken over a long period of time, old growth forests become these really, really diverse forests which are constantly experiencing these small scale disturbances and regenerating from them. We also, um, and I'm gonna break these down individually, sort of in the way that Andrea did as well. Uh, there are gaps in the canopy, so it's not this sort of even, you know, like a plantation, all the trees are about the same height, all the trees are about the same age. There's, there's holes in the canopy all over the place. There's tons of dead wood everywhere. Um, and there's many different species of trees. So different uh, sizes and shapes of disturbances create opportunities for trees who are tolerant of different amounts of shade and who need sort of different site conditions in order to be successful. All of these features are the features that we can sort of empirically, we can look at old growth forests and say, yeah, they have all these things, but they're also features which we're learning uh, directly benefit wildlife in a whole bunch of different ways. So big trees. So big trees are cool. Uh, there was a time when uh, big trees were called decadent and people would cut them or herbicide them just to get them out of the way. And the idea was that as trees become really large, they're past maturity, they're no longer efficiently growing timber. And what's a tree good for if not growing timber, right? But what we've learned since then in research about big trees and old growth forests is that these big trees are providing a number of important eco, um, ecological functions. So they have these really large complex canopies which provide nesting and foraging habitat for many birds and mammals and um, their thicker bark and their complex canopies also provide habitat for small mammals. So we know that Indiana bat will, will uh, nest under shaggy bark trees, um, which normally have to be larger diameter trees. Um, and it provides all this really cool habitat for arthropods, bugs, insects, um, which in turn provides really good foraging habitat for birds like the nut hatches, which forage in the crevices of those barks. These big trees often will have cavities, holes in them, which Andrew alluded to, which provide habitat for many birds and animals. And specifically, cavities in larger trees are required by other specific animals like barred owl, pileated woodpecker, and even bears have been known to successfully hibernate often in trees um, when there are big enough trees with big enough holes in them. We also know, you know, just sort of as a uh, a general, you know, forest fact. Uh, one, you know, once thought to be sort of this woo woo wee new agey idea of how, you know, trees are all connected to each other. Science, it's a scientific fact that trees share resources with each other and, um, and pass messages essentially communicate with each other through these underground networks facilitated by root grafting and also by these mycorrhizal networks, these networks of, of fungal threads that connect these root systems. 
Um, and that larger diameter trees, especially out west, the research has shown that larger diameter trees are hubs. So they're facilitating this, this nutrient sharing process um, and communication process. I also think about, um, you know, deadwood is really important. I'll talk about that in a second. Uh, deadwood of all different types is really important. So all different species of trees, the wood has different quality. All different diameters of deadwood have different qualities. And so we can think about big trees also as future large diameter dead wood, which is not you know, a failure, but is actually just another sort of compelling life stage uh, in being a big tree. And they're also um, habitat for these unusual lichens, mosses, mosses and other bryophytes, um, which can, we're learning increasingly, there are species that can really only occur in older forests and on bigger trees. So, just one second. Andrew talked about structurally diverse forests. I've started calling them complex forests, just because I like it a little bit better. And all that means is that uh, they're forests with, again, a wide range of different tree sizes and ages. Uh, in the same area, we might call vertical structural diversity. So in the same vertical space, there'll be a small tree, a medium-sized tree, a, a tall tree. And then also pockets of forests of different stages. So we call that horizontal structural diversity, where if you're looking at a cross section of the forest, you would see pockets of older trees, pockets of younger trees, pockets of middle-aged trees. Um, and all of these different, you know, the different species that will come into these different areas, tree species, uh, and, and also these different ages afford different habitat for birds, mammals, invertebrates, um, bugs, uh, and all this other stuff, all of which are really important. So, you know, to Andrea's point, there are, there are bird species which need, you know, a tight, tall, mature canopy. And there are bird species which need, you know, sort of a mid-story, middle-sized trees. Bird species that need a shrubby understory layer and bird species that need combinations of all of those things at different stages in their life. And what we know is that sort of old growth forests provide all of these things within a relatively small geographic area. Um, and so, you know, having those things in, in close contact with each other or having those things sort of in the same forest allow us to, to create habitat for a wider array of different wildlife species. Overall, forests which are more complex, we know are also more resilient. That just means that they can stay healthy in the midst of great disturbance and climate change and all of these other things, which also affords wildlife benefits because wildlife can continue to use these forests rather than having these forests which are sort of devastated by uh, different large scale disturbance events. Dead wood is really, really important. In my research about old growth forests sort of a lot of the really, really important endemic, you know, features you only get in old growth forests are linked to big trees and deadwood. Um, so retaining and actually recruiting, making a lot of deadwood on the forest floor is of all different kinds is really, really important. It's habitat for, again, invertebrates, bugs, uh, fungi and amphibians. Um, invertebrates are really, really important. They're really hard to see. We don't know that they're there most of the time but they provide the base of the forest food web. So they're feeding the animals that feed the animals that feed the animals that we know about and that we really care about. Um, salamanders are also thought to be um, an indicator species of that there's enough deadwood in the forest or of old growth forests. They're thought to be a, an apex predator in that forest floor space. So of those tiny little uh, soil invertebrates. This is a crazy fact, but is, is just sort of so mind blowing that I have to put in there. Salamanders combined are account for the most biomass of any vertebrate predator in the Eastern forest. So if you took all the salamanders and you took all the coyotes, uh, all the salamanders weigh more and they are this sort of vertebrate predator. Um, invertebrates and fungi are also really important uh, for nutrient cycling. So they, they help turn dead wood into soil, which is accessible by future generations of trees and plants and this really complex system that they use to break down uh, wood. Uh, Deadwood also provides, stores carbon, provides nutrients for future generation of trees and plants. Um, and interestingly, research has also shown us that there's often more living biomass in this fungi, invertebrates, amphibians, and all these other things in a dead tree than in living trees. So this, these two slides I stole directly from Andrea Shortsleeve. Um, 
And I was like, oh my God, is she going to use these same slides? But she didn't. Um, just side note on invertebrates. So here's the number of, of species of all these different types in Vermont um, without invertebrates, right? So there's, there's a bunch of birds, there's some mammals, there's fish, you know, all these other things. Here is the amount of species of all these different things with invertebrates. We have 21, about 21,000 species of invertebrates compared to say 58 species of native mammals. Uh, so they are an incredible source of, of biodiversity, and they're also what E.O. Wilson would call the little things that make the world work. Um, he also thinks we should start calling invertebrates wildlife. Uh, and worldwide, I should also say that we know of about 2 million invertebrate species. There are perhaps as many as 30 million or more uh, versus 60,000 vertebrates worldwide. Canopy gaps are also really important. So um, creating just holes in the canopy. It creates higher temperatures, which create higher uh, densities of flying insects. And some of our insectivorous birds will fly through these areas uh, and catch birds on the wing and perch on the other side. Um, just creating gaps in the canopy, anytime you let light hit the forest floor, you're also creating opportunities for regeneration. Pockets of small trees and plants, which are nesting, foraging, singing perches for other birds. Um, and generally, you're just creating a more complex, diverse forest canopy, which is more like old growth forest canopies. And finally, young forest, um, what we might call early successional forests. These are large areas, areas of large disturbances. They are our most diverse forest type in terms of just the number of species, wildlife, tree, plants that, that utilize them. Um, really, really important for neotropical songbirds uh, and for some species of specific concern like rough grouse and woodcock. We know that pockets of young forests are underrepresented across our landscape. Remember, we don't have the historic mix of different forest types across our landscape. They also support a lot of soft mass species. So these are species like Andrew talked about, cherries, raspberries, blackberries, which everything from birds to bears uh, will eat. So knowing all these things, these are all features that we're gonna try and actively create on the Andrews Community Forest. And we're gonna do it under a management regime that's called ecological forestry or ecological forest management, ecological silviculture, new forestry, disturbance-based forestry. And basically the big idea, which should, shouldn't seem so crazy, I can't believe anyone ever did it any other way, but the idea is to manage forests like they manage themselves, to manage them as complex systems, not just as a bunch of trees, um, and to manage them for complexity, diversity, and resilience. So, the way that we are going to maximize uh, wildlife habitat in addition to overall forest health is by sort of approaching this in a holistic way. So we're going to encourage healthy, complex forests and with a wide ra range of natural processes instead of sort of having a symptomatic approach where we're approaching each species differently. So by encouraging um, just healthy forests in general, we're going to encourage a wide range of different wildlife species that are well suited to the site. Um, and support a healthier landscape. And in so doing, you know, a lot of foresters also think about sort of growing valuable forest products. I definitely, you know, I think that renewable resources, wood is really, really cool. Um, and I th I'm gonna talk a little bit about why that is in a second. Um, and I think we should be, we can be really proud of harvesting wood under the right circumstances. But I really think about just growing healthy trees and growing healthy forests and understanding that if we're growing healthy trees and healthy forests, there will be uh, valuable wood to harvest. So in practice, what this means, that's me and Andrea out at the Heinsberg Town Forest, where I've been doing a project like this, this over the last couple of years, we manage for actively, we're creating many different ages, sizes, and species of trees. Uh, we're creating gaps in the canopy. So creating holes in the canopy by cutting trees to create those canopy gap features and establish a pocket of regeneration. We're retaining and recruiting big old legacy trees at every entry. So we're, we're recruiting and keeping these trees just to be big trees, just to provide those habitat benefits and to eventually fall on the ground. And we're gonna keep on doing that, recruiting more and more of these big trees into the forest that we're just not gonna cut just because they're big. Um, we're gonna cut trees as big trees as well, but we're gonna retain a lot of these big old biological legacy trees creating small pockets of early successional habitat, other unique habitats, and protecting uh, sensitive and unusual features. So other goals, um, you know, sort of on a small scale, and I'm gonna broaden out in a second, 
we're going to release red and uh, and especially white oak. There's a lot of white oak trees at the Andrews Community Forest. So releasing just means uh, cutting the trees that are competing with these trees, which will allow them to expand their crowns, produce more mass, more acorns for wildlife. We're going to um, create pockets of young regeneration adjacent to deer wintering areas. So deer that are wintering over in these wintering areas that we have at Andrews will have food nearby that they can browse on. And we're going to create conditions for red and white oak and white pine regeneration through creating, basically driving these natural disturbances, creating what we call groups, you know, small pockets of trees, which simulates a wind microburst or a small scale disturbance event, scarify the soil. So actually try and scuff up that top layer of the soil a little bit and leave tops high, like those ones behind Andrea in that picture there to also provide some browse protections from deer because there is a very deer, high deer population up there. So, you know, one thing that I'm often asked and, and that I often think about is, you know, why do we need to do this? What's the role of humans in this landscape? And I think it's really important that we recognize that we live in a highly altered world on a highly altered landscape. Some people call this the Anthropocene, which is a, a geologic epoch defined by basically humans um, controlling every aspect of the natural world or most of them. Um, our, in our, on our environment, there are 50% of the animals on the planet that there were in 1970. So not 50% of the species, 50% of the number of animals on the planet. I assume that doesn't include invertebrates. Um, we've created these massive ecosystem problems, mass extinctions, reductions in global biodiversity, climate change, invasive exotic pests, pathogens, altered, degraded, shrinking, and fragmented ecosystems. Um, in Vermont alone, you may not realize this, but we have extirpated many native animal species and driven several to extinction. The picture of that animal behind there is the Eastern elk, which used to be a forest elk that was in Vermont uh, in as late as the 1700s and is now extinct. Passenger pigeons, same thing. The Eastern catamount, same thing. Um, and, and several of the species that, that we had just 300 years ago are no longer in Vermont. Um, so in this context, it's really, uh, I said it is silly. I don't know if that's the right word or not, to think that things can become better completely on their own, or that there is nothing that we can do to make it better. There is no role that humans have on that landscape that can be positive. Or even, you know, I think we have a responsibility to try and correct some of these things and try and, um, you know, sort of right our wrongs as best we can with the knowledge that we have now about the way these ecosystems work. And in that context, I think that humans really can be a keystone species that we can provide for this massive uh, array of different, of, of biodiversity in a way that's actually positive. Um, and this is the last thing I'm going to say because I know I'm out of time. Uh, I also encourage people often to think in a broader context, and this usually applies to people thinking about resource utilization. Um, but uh, it's important to recognize that local renewable resources is positive, producing local renewable resources is positive uh, for wildlife here, and then it's also positive globally. So we have more local control over our resource impacts instead of <clears throat> displacing the impacts of our resources somewhere else in the world where maybe those controls aren't in place. Um, rejecting this not in my backyard mentality, which just displaces the impact of our resources and our resource consumption somewhere else is really important. There's also social um, impacts, environmental justice, environmental racism that are associated with that attitude as well. Um, allowing people to harvest would sometimes make a little money, lowers development pressure, protects forested land. Um, and it's just really important that we sort of recognize uh, the impact of our resource consumption globally on wildlife and on ecosystems in general. So the US is less than 5% of global population, but we consume a third of the resources. Um, and all of those things have impact on wildlife and all of those things can be mitigated somewhat by using local resources and by using renewable resources instead of non-renewable resources, rather than just displacing our resource production somewhere else or the impacts of it somewhere else. All right, we talked about demonstration education. Last slide. Um, I want, this is, uh, it's really, really important to me and really, really important to this project that everybody continues to stay involved. And I really, I don't wanna have just offered you a chance to learn about this stuff. I really want you to learn about it and to engage with it. So stay tuned for some virtual events coming up. You can check out Andrews Community Forest Facebook page, uh, Front Porch Forum, my email list. You can send me an email at ethan.tapper.vermont.gov to sign up for that. 
We have a bunch of events coming up this fall on emerald ash borer, uh, carbon and climate change, forest birds, ecology, um, specifically focused around this forest management and the Andrews Community Forest. I'll also be publishing regular video updates on the Andrews Community Forest playlist on my YouTube channel. And we're gonna try a bunch of other stuff as well. And hopefully someday have in-person events again. Okay, woof. Wouldn't it be nice to have in-person events again? I'm looking forward to those. I am too. Thank you, Ethan and Andrea. Um, if anybody has any questions, go ahead and type them in the chat box and we'll run through a few of those. We are at eight o'clock, so if you must go, um, we are thanking you for joining us tonight. And um, as Ethan said, you can sign up for Ethan's uh, uh, e-newsletter. You can also sign up for Vermont Coverts by emailing me and or by signing up on our website. And uh, we'll, you'll hear about all these and other events that are occurring uh, from our organizations and others as well. Um, let's see, Sean wants to know, why do you need to create gaps rather than let them occur naturally? Thanks, Sean. So, so with a lot of this stuff, it's a combination of different things. So, you know, one thing is recognizing that, again, that we have these incredibly young forests. And so those gap dynamics are something that established in forests over time. So over time, hopefully, you know, who knows with, with all the different stuff we got coming down the pike, but hopefully those gap dynamics will establish naturally over time. The role that we can play is by basically proactively creating them sooner than they would naturally occur. Um, and so we, in order to support the diversity of biodiversity on our landscape, which is like so under threat right now, um, we know that creating these structures, that creating this like structurally diverse forest and canopy gaps and dead wood and big trees, all these other things have serious biodiversity implications. And so, and they're not present across our landscape. So if there's stuff that we can do to create those sooner, also recognizing that they will also be created naturally, which is awesome. Um, that's why we're doing that. That sounds great. You know, it's really fun um, between uh, the Hinesburg Town Forest, Andrews, um, community forest, uh, lower otter, we're able to see these different practices and techniques uh, in action. And as landowners, uh, you're welcome to visit any of these places so that you can see what might occur on your own property, because this is not just beneficial at any one of these state-owned lands. It's beneficial to take some of these practices and implement them on your own land as well. Um, another question comes from Robert. How do you scarify the forest soils? I think that's Bob Hyams. Uh, so scarification, the, the reason that we're doing this job, this project, we're starting it now, uh, instead of in the winter time, is because uh, the specific species that we're trying to encourage um, that are, we think should be a bigger part of the ecosystems at Andrews, specifically uh, red oak, excuse me, white oak, white pine, they do better with a little bit of scarification and how they would get that naturally is that there'd be these large scale disturbance events where a bunch of trees would fall over and they would pull up that mineral soil, those lower layers of the soil and expose that. Um, or there would be fires, you know, sort of low intensity fires in the understory of the forest that would burn off that top layer of duff and expose the mineral soil underneath. Um, so we're going to be creating scarification just by virtue of working in the forest without the ground being frozen and without uh, snow covering the ground. And we'll actually probably intentionally try to create some scarification. Now, scarification is not, uh, we don't want big ruts everywhere. That's compaction and leads to erosion and um, root damage to trees and stuff like that. We want just those top few inches of the soil scuffed up. So what I'm going to tell the logger to do, for instance, is He's going to tip these trees over and I'm going to ask him to pull the trees with the top still on it a little bit, um, which will just sort of drag on the surface of the soil and just scuff it up. That's how we're going to do it. And, and just by virtue of skidding trees across the ground and stuff like that, we'll create some scarification. Um, it's also really interesting, you know, because so white pine really, really the seeds really do better when there's a little bit of a, a scarification like that. Red oak, it's even more complicated. Um, we're trying to regenerate red oak. Red oak acorns that are that just fall on the ground, uh, about 98% of them get eaten before they ever get a chance to actually sprout. If they're covered by just an inch of soil, that goes down to 50%. So we're actually trying to 
you know, we are cutting some oak trees and when the oak trees fall, the acorns fall on the ground. And then we're going to try and like skid over them, you know, use the trees falling to sort of bury them in soil. And then we're also going to try and leave treetops on top of them so that when they germinate that deer can't browse them all. Um, so try and do all sort of all those things at once in the course of the operations that we're already doing. Great. I've got a comment and a question. The comment uh, is from Sabina and she wants uh, me to let everyone know that uh, Jericho is hosting a bio blitz right now. I mean, a bio blitz is when you go into an area and you try and identify everything you that you can and you get paired up oftentimes with experts. They're really a lot of fun. Um, and uh, it's at Mobs Farm and they can get more information at uh, jerichovt.org slash bioblitz and she's going to type that in the chat box for anybody that's interested and anyone can participate not just Jericho residents and um, Dan wants to know how do you create the gaps and encourage certain plants without inviting more aggressive invasive exotics to come first? That's a good question. Um... You know, invasives are part of our landscape and, you know, if we, if we, at this point, I don't, you know, I want them to be as little a part of our landscape as they can be. Um, and so one way that we can do better and make that less of a problem is by more actively dealing with invasives on our landscape, period. Um, we can't totally prevent them from establishing. We, but we can lower the population, you know, on a, on a given property or even in your neighborhood, you can lower the amount of seed bearing invasive plants just by actively controlling them. And there's a lot of really good resources about how to identify them and control them at vtinvasives.org. Um, and I've also done on my YouTube channel, I have a couple of webinars about controlling invasives as well um, and videos um, that you can look at. Uh, but we're just going to, it's, we're just entering into a world where we're all going to need to be able to identify these plants and be able to regularly look for them and deal with them. So, you know, it could be that some of the gaps that we create invasives are going to come in. And then when that happens, that's another, again, a, an important positive role that we as humans can play in these ecosystems is then dealing with it, right? Like killing those plants. Um, and so I think that the structures that we're creating are, are have enough good parts of them that it outweighs the risk of potentially, you know, having a couple invasive plants as long as we're willing to deal with them when they crop up. Well, great. Well, that's it for the questions right now. And we've run past our eight o'clock hour. I'd like to thank again, everybody for joining us and Ethan and Andrea for such a wonderful presentation with so much information. Uh, this will, was recorded and will be posted on both Ethan's channel and the Vermont Covert's YouTube channel. So you can see pieces of it again if that's something you want or share it with others as well. And again, thank you for joining us and have a great night. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.